So I want to welcome everyone on this sunny Sunday. <clears throat> the, uh, the first of these, this year's uh, afternoon, Sunday afternoon reflections on Dhamma or the, the way things are. And so to uh, make it clear where I'm coming from, uh, there's no attempt to tell you how things are. Uh, what I say is, is a reflective thinking rather than doctrinal positioning. Uh, just to make the difference known that, uh, that uh, in uh, the Buddhist style, is uh, we're trying to open the mind up. Uh, we're not trying to condition the mind. We're not trying to convert or or put anything onto you or intimidate or try to argue a point, convince you of anything I might be saying, but to stimulate the mind towards the questioning, pondering, uh, reflecting ability contemplating. And even though this is, uh, is quite ordinary for us, and so much of our social conditioning is, is to take positions and, and to think, have, have uh, fixed positions on, on almost everything. Not to contemplate the meaning of existence or the purpose of life, or what life is about, or what love is, or what is death, and all this, but uh, to have various views and opinions about it. <clears throat> and I know from my own social conditioning that, that uh, one was uh, expected to have opinions. And uh, if you didn't have opinions, then of course that uh, means you were stupid. So even sometimes you gave, you had opinions you didn't necessarily agree with. You you still uh, felt unless you you came you had an opinion on something somebody might think that you really uh, didn't know anything about anything. So I managed to to form opinions sometimes half-hearted views and that sometimes very strong views. Very. Uh, emotionally charged opinions that one would uh, could get very uh, aggressive about. But in the in the spirit of the Dhamma, then we're we're beginning to look at that that need to defend ourselves, need to uh, prove ourselves in some way, feeling that somehow we have to we, we've got to become something, we've got to get something we don't have. Uh, we generally feel the way we are, we're not good enough, there's something wrong with us, and therefore we've got to do something uh, to make ourselves better. But oftentimes feeling that we, we wouldn't succeed anyway. So, so a lot of modern life seems to be merely an attempt to just distract the mind. Modern materialist uh, countries like this uh, provide us with a, with a wide range of distractions or just keeping the mind occupied. The news, the gossip, the telly, the, uh, all the different uh, things available to us, push-button society in which the mind easily can, can absorb into, uh, into things that uh, do not, we don't have to reflect on them, they merely just seem to to uh, absorb our attention. And one, this uh, title for this Sunday is "Life is Love," and so this is this isn't uh, uh, meant to be uh, a kind of of uh, inspiring talk, but contemplating the just these very words, life and love and what we really mean by them, or what maybe our own uh, definitions of these words maybe are 
are too narrow. I'm just questioning. And it's a, one thing in, in meditation, you're beginning to break down the, the, the conditioning of the mind, which does think in terms of life and death, as if they were uh, death cancelled out life. There's life, which is conscious experience within a human, within a, within a body, and then there's death, which is the absence of consciousness, or the the whole uh, uh, process, uh, mental physical process uh, stops and decays, and that's that's death, which means that uh, implies a kind of a total end of something that was once living and is now dead. So that that's a, that's a kind of dualistic thinking. We think of life and death as. Uh, uh, as, as as opposition, one opposing the other, and so life is uh, is identified with the conscious experience of our own bodies. The fact that that we are alive now, we are conscious, we we can feel, we can we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, remember, imagine. Uh, use our minds for various tasks, we can move about. And so life is, uh, is identified with the, with the body and, and, and consciousness through the, through the senses. And then we perceive death as when, when all this, this process stops, the body stops, the consciousness ceases and the body decays, and that's death. But yet, in in religious uh, terminology, sometimes we talk about eternal life, or deathlessness, or immortality. And uh, and Buddhism uh, sometimes is is identified with a kind of atheism, meaning a kind of denial of of anything like uh, like eternal life or an immortal or immortality or these kind of words oftentimes are associated with with other religious uh, approaches but it is very clear that the buddha was pointing to the realization of the deathless uh, and this uh, so so it's a realization it's a it's a it's a recognition, a direct knowing of immortality. And the word immortality, of course, is another word that, uh, it means deathless, absence of death, isn't it? Immortal. Mortality is death. And im is a neg negation of death. And yet immortality in the English language oftentimes means that like, is a kind of romantic view of uh, immortal, uh, like a soul or a, a separate thing that 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 lives in a in a conscious separate form forever. And I know I know that from my own religious background, before becoming a Buddhist, there was definitely a feeling that that uh, an encouragement to think in terms of an immortal soul that. A deathless soul that was unique, that would go on and live forever for eternity, and so the this, of course, uh, uh, as as I grew up and started uh, questioning all these concepts, that didn't make sense to me. So I, and personally, it didn't appeal to me. Didn't I never felt that as a person, as a separate being, that there's anything in its separateness that was worth carrying on forever. Any thought I had, the body itself, the, the, and there didn't, there didn't seem to be anything when, when I investigated that you would want to last forever in terms of, of the conditioning of the body or the mind. Would I want to be Ajahn Sumato forever? Or would I want to be male 
masculine forever. But I want. <laughs> what would what would you want to live forever? Uh, if you know, in terms of what of, of your personality or the sense of yourself as a separate being. And I recently attended a funeral in California where the, the um, Master Xunhua, uh, a Chinese Mahayana monk, died last uh, June. Uh, and I knew him very well. He visited here in England, I think, about five years ago. And, and um, whenever I would go to California, I'd usually visit him and stay a few days in his monastery. And uh, he was always, he was a, a teacher that would emphasize the fact of coming out of nothing and returning to nothing. And so uh, I went to see him in, uh, when he, before he died in the hospital where he was in an intensive care unit and he was in a coma. And so that you could see he was still breathing and they had all this, this uh, technology, all these machines and tubes going into him and kind of pumping him with air and putting things into him and draining things out of him. And he was, you know, alive in the sense that in, in our terms, in the way we usually think of life, he was still breathing, but he wasn't, he was in a coma. So you couldn't say he was conscious in the way that we're, we usually mean conscious. But the perception of that he was still alive was there. And so I asked some of the monks, I said, uh, what, what, what do you, when do you expect him to die? What are you going to do when he dies? And, and nobody wanted to talk about it. They said, we're going to try to keep him alive. So you torture the poor thing with running tubes into him and and kind of forcing this kind of this life what we think is life into him by pumping him full of things uh, just to, just to just to have the the feeling that he's living our teacher is living and then uh, about a week later as I, I was in Seattle uh, the news came that he died, which didn't surprise me. And so then I, I phoned some, a monk I knew, one his chief disciple, and and of course the, the idea of Master Hua being dead was uh, was uh, you know something that they knew inevitably was going to happen. But but the mind wasn't wasn't didn't want to think about it. Wanted to think in terms of he's alive rather than he's dead. But the, the teaching uh, impressed me that Matwa was emphasizing coming out of nothing and returning to nothing. And so even the word nothing is a, is a word sometimes we don't appreciate because in our dualistic thought patterns we always, we conceive of nothingness as a kind of total blank, uh, a vacuum, a void with nothing in it and no potential for anything. Just like a sterile uh, vacuum. And we say, go, return, from coming out of nothing, returning to nothing. We don't appreciate the, the kind of miraculous quality that that, 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 that that is pointing to. The arising, the ceasing, from nothing to something and back to nothing. Because the some things of life we, we, we give our, we give our allegiance to. We like some things. We want, we want things. We want conditions. We want people. We want, uh, we want to have relationships. We want to have, have, uh, respect or, or even, uh, just keeping the body alive. It's something. At least it's something we can understand and and relate to. But nothing uh, me it sounds very depressing or like it's a, 
it's it's an annihilist, annihilationist, a nihilistic kind of perception. And yet in mystical experience, if you read Christian mystics or Sufis or in, in the Buddhist terms, the, the experience of God is nothing. Or the experience of ultimate truth is no thing. And uh, this, this, this point sometimes is completely overlooked, misunderstood, and in popular religious teachings never even mentioned. Because uh, usually we, we give eternalist views, like when we die we go to heaven and live forever, happy, and if we've been good then we'll live, and, we're, and uh, then we'll go and we'll live in a beautiful place with God and be happy and smile forever. And, it, and it, we're, we're thinking in terms of, of just the pleasantness that we can, that we know about in this form. Happiness, uh, beautiful things to see and, and beautiful sounds and all that, all the best on the conditioned realm. We hope we'll, to live in a, in a place where there's no pain, no suffering, only beauty and pleasure forever uh, is, is a, is a kind of childlike view of of what would be nice having ice cream every day. So the the uh, but the mystical vision. Or they say the, the, when you get into, into going deeply into the way things are, getting beyond just the, the banal perceptions of, 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 of uh, social conditioning, the realizations aren't, uh, are, aren't just trying to make everything pretty and nice and live in a realm of happiness. But the experience is experience of no thing. Emptiness, they say, and oftentimes use the word emptiness, or selflessness, non-self. In in Theravada, they emphasize anatta, non-self, or they they uh, the the realization is nothingness, selflessness, emptiness, desirelessness, unconditioned, unborn uncreated, and these words convey a realization. Because the, 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 this is to be realized, it's something that you can know, a realization is, isn't a, a belief in some abstract idea, but it is something you can know, know in a very profound way, not know about in terms of in terms of of having an, having the the perceptions of of deathlessness or immortality, but it is real. It's reality. It's realization. So the religious path then is is difficult for most people because our conditioned mind tends to to see no significance. We we don't unless we have a lot of uh, of kind of intuitive awareness and sensitivity already, we tend to uh, settle down to to a more vulgar expression of life, of just materialism, just trying to make life comfortable and pleasant and secure. But in spite of all that, and here in Britain, we, I think we've been fairly successful in making life uh, pleasant and secure and, and you know, enough of the good things. And even at its best, even if, you know, even, even materialism at its best leaves one completely dissatisfied. It's not satisfactory to us. Because there's a part of us that isn't being nourished in that. It's starving, you know, even though you might be well nourished on the level of, of 
organic food and and uh, and uh, com- physical comforts and good medical care and all the rest. Somehow there is that isn't enough for us. We c- that is not satisfying to us. That can merely kind of that, that's all right, and there's nothing to you know. It shouldn't be despised, but it but in itself there's a, a longing for the deathless for the ultimate truth and love then is in, 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 in its pure expression is love of what is ultimately true not just love of of things that are temporary and 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 just uh, emotionally uh, that we need them emotionally and and uh, and uh, hold on to things that we feel we love because everything everything that we love will be separated from eventually in some way we're going to have to separate just like master shuanhua died i mean we loved master shuanhua but then he died and so when we when I looked at him, they had his uh, his corpse, his body on so in a, in a coffin that we could see, we could see the head. And uh, we were given a chance to kind of contemplate, meditate on on this face, the the face of his dead teacher. And actually, in his coffin, after in in the hospital with all the tubes going in through him, he looked pretty horrid when he was alive. And the last memory of him as living was kind of bloated face and tubes going in everywhere. And he looked pretty dreadful, you know, visually. Just, But when when uh, he actually died and, and they put him in, that, uh, in, in the coffin, in a refrigerated coffin, and uh, he looked quite beautiful. Face was was quite looked very very uh, kind of radiant in a way, and so uh, and I kept thinking I come out of nothing and return to nothing. And while while contemplating this, of course it it and, and actually my, my visual consciousness was focused on his uh, dead face. It uh, just the, uh, just that uh, that just that kind of meeting in conscious experience uh, seemed to, to 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 mean a lot. And the fact that that uh, one felt the the rea- the reality of his teaching. One I could see if I started thinking, "Oh, Master was dead," and go get caught up in my conditioning my mental conditioning, then I would feel grief. I'd feel this sense of loss. I mean, he's dead now. I'll never see him again. Uh, and what are we going to do without him? And all the, the, the thoughts, the emotional thoughts that come from, say, the conditioning of the mind, and the sense of loss of a person, loss of someone you respect and love. Uh, where you'd have this emotional feeling of grief, So grief then is is just that it's a it's that feeling of loss. We experience grief a lot, and even before somebody we love dies or leaves us, don't we? We we just in everyday life there's a certain amount of grief to it, losing something, a sense of loss or separation. When you're having a good time with somebody and you have to leave them, that sense of having to separate that is. That's a that's a experience of grief, isn't it? It's a sense of loss because of the conditioning of the mind is very much like that. It will, uh, you know, when we're caught into the conditioning of the mind, the, the emotional habits, the the language, the perceptions, and so forth. Then the separation from the love, that feeling is grief. But then when you, you let go of grief, not suppress it, but when, when looking upon Master Hua's uh, 
body, this corpse, then uh, say I I change my my direction from thinking, getting caught up in thinking about him as dead, but remembering the teaching, coming out of nothing, returning to nothing, and suddenly this marvelous peace and even joyfulness came rather than grief. Because it became very real to me that he was, that what had died was merely a conditioned thing. I mean, we one created him into being something. A great Chinese monk, a master, a uh, enlightened being, uh, whatever. You could project onto him all kinds of, of uh, perceptions. And he was, uh, you know, he was 77 years old. He's Chinese. He, he couldn't speak English very well. Though when he did speak English, it sounded a bit comical. But he had this kind of mystery to him. He never knew what he, what he was, you know, what was in his mind. What does he think of me? Is he reading my mind? I remember one time, uh, I was, I was uh, invited to their temple in Los Angeles, and they, and and so I was, uh, I was asked to give a talk one night, instruction on Buddhist meditation to, to the nuns, the bhikkhunis, in this temple in Los Angeles, and so I was sitting up uh, in front on a on a kind of, uh, it was. Their temple in Los Angeles was an old Baptist church. I was sitting in kind of where the pulpit was and uh, giving this talk. And Master Hua kept kind of walking around, looking at me. And, and, and he kept you know, walking around the room and he'd stand off there and he'd look at me. And then he'd walk to the back and he'd look at me. And then he'd walk over there and he'd look at me. And he'd walk right up next to me and look at me while I was talking. And but I didn't. I, I mean, I I was wondering what he was doing. I, um, but uh, he was, you know, he was sizing me up just to see how, you know, how what I would do, because I was talking about mindfulness, about meditation. I was giving instruction. Well, he seemed to have. No, he didn't. Um, he uh, he he tended to, after that to to say very complimentary things about me, which I don't, which were which I of course appreciate. But he, anyway, he he and I did. We were we. I felt a, a great affinity with him personally. Uh, uh, these kind of ways of feeling about certain people that you you kind of you know, almost immediately take to, and you don't know why, and why you take to that one and not another one. Anyway, that's unexplainable. But this, but this emphasis on nothing and emptiness, uh, too, too many people, it terrifies them. And uh, when we talk about love, then people feel inspired. Because love to most people is, is, is a word that conveys emotional uh, experience, a way of uh, a, a happiness, uh, a way of looking at life that, that uh, gives a quality and a beauty to our experience that we don't feel when there's no love in it. If our life is merely uh, a critical life, if we only see things in in ways of what's wrong, what I don't like, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with Britain, what's wrong with the EU, what's wrong with Bosnia, and everything else. I mean, we just get depressed, and then because that's not uh, that 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 isn't. Developing a loving relationship is it's it's dwelling on things that are wrong, 
and things that are wrong, of course, they're not denying that they're, we're not saying everything's right. But this sense of being wrong, if we dwell on it, if we fill our minds with what's wrong, then the result of that is a feeling of we hate ourselves because we, 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 we dwell on what's wrong, what we think is wrong with ourselves. We dwell on what's wrong with somebody else. We dwell on what's wrong with, with Britain, with Europe, with America, with whatever. And that, and when, when you, when you just think, uh, get obsessed with what's wrong, then you feel depression and despair. What, what else could you feel? Because you, you're, you're deliberately filling your mind with negative uh, views. And negative views, if that's all you, if that's what you obsess your mind with, then the result is despair and depression. Whereas it's, it's, a, it's a natural feeling to feel despair. When, when we, when we're, say, when we fall in love, falling with, using just the romantic images of falling in love, then then we don't, when in the sense of love, then we're not dwelling on what's wrong with anything. We, we tend to uh, not upset, I mean, it doesn't mean love blinds us to what's wrong, but it, it's no longer the, uh, the thing that we're very interested in. We're more interested in, 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 the, in the relationship itself and the feeling of that, that love always has this sense of union and oneness. And it, it isn't discriminative, it's not, it's not trying to make a big thing or make a problem about even what's wrong with somebody or something. So love in terms of experience is, is greatly desired, but also it's a, it's an experience that we can also fear because it does mean to love one has to be open to life you have to put yourself in a in a kind of vulnerable state where the uh, where say the critical faculty makes you gives you the sense that you're protecting yourself i'm no fool the cynic you know i'm nobody's fool i don't fall for that slushy stuff you know, I'm going to see, you know, nobody's going to hurt me. So we can, we can feel very much obsessed with, with, with the intellectual, critical side as a, as a kind of defense and protection where uh, love, and, and oftentimes we get hurt, especially when we fall in love. We're, we're very vulnerable and we're easily hurt. So then we, uh, after a few experiences of being bruised, hurt, mangled, abused, from being open and vulnerable, then we tend to seek protection, develop the hide of a rhinoceros. And there is that, that the verse in Dhammapada, go alone like rhinoceros. And I know monks that quote that all the time because they're so f afraid of love. They say, the Buddha said to be like a rhinoceros. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, uh, that's their excuse. The Buddha said it, so I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do. And it's just, it, uh, and I mean, of course, it's out of context. And uh, and and all metaphors, you know, are need to be, you know, realized within their context. They're not absolutes. All metaphors uh, fall apart eventually. So, I mean, it isn't to get reborn as a rhinoceros either. <laughs> There'd be something. Say, the old Buddhist Buddha said we should all practice so we can be reborn as rhinoceroses. An inspiring religion, isn't it? <laughs> The thing that, that is frightening uh, of being open and vulnerable as a person is that we do get hurt that way. 
if you are an open, uh, like innocence, isn't it? Children are very open and, and uh, because they're innocent, but they're also easily hurt. You can you can corrupt, you can can harm children very easily because they they haven't lived long enough to develop the height of a rhinoceros. They're not cynical yet. They're not they're not defensive. And so they can be, one can easily uh, abuse or, or harm them because they are open. And that's one of the, I think one of the images we have of the present day where we hear so much about child abuse, isn't it? Where uh, parents have, have uh, sexually abused their own children is a kind of horrific uh, image, uh, shocking to, to most of us because the ideal is that parents sort of protect the children. I mean, that's, that's what I was always uh, brought up to think. They should be protecting you while you're in that innocent phase. So you, you aren't being exposed to, to uh, harmful things that, that can uh, destroy you, shatter your life at a, such a, an innocent age. Or we read about uh, the war in Bosnia and, and just the, the, all the orphans, the, the mangled, the, the uh, uh, children that have, have, have lost arms and legs and, and orphaned and that, just uh, uh, through this uh, horrendous war that's been going on. We, we can feel such sadness. Just those images are incredibly sad, pathetic to the mind. Because in it, sometimes, especially around the loss of innocence, the abuse, the taking advantage, the destruction of the innocent to us is something that one feels a, a great aversion to, a great indignation arises in the mind. So this realm that we live in this realm of personality, of some being somebody, something. We are that something, that somebody, the goodness, the, the, the good fortune, the wealth, the security, the family security, the, the, the health, the uh, social security, the whole lot we realize is something that can be taken away from us. That there's no security in this realm as, as a person, in the conditioned realm. I mean, if you have all the money in the world or whatever, it's still, you can lose it. You can, you can have, you can be the richest person in the world, but you can also lose it. And you know it. You can have a secure family with uh, good, good parents and, and a beautiful place to live and suddenly lose it like uh, people in, in Yugoslavia. It's, uh, I mean, suddenly, five minutes to leave their houses. And they have to leave. Within five minutes, just suddenly somebody stands at the door and says, leave, and you leave. And then you're separated from your parents or your husband or wife, and you don't know what's happened to anything. And so you have to just, you're put in this state of, of not knowing and fear and terror. And so we, these, 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 these are things to consider. This could happen to us. Hope it won't. But it certainly recognize that possibility and before I die of having everything, everyone I know, everything that I like and that suddenly taken away from me. And then death, of course, the death of the body is that experience. You leave everything, separate from everything. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. So that's why the Buddha was saying, do not attach, do not fight, do not seek refuge or values in the conditioned realm. It's not, it's not a, a pessimistic teaching, it's pointing to the reality that, that this realm is like this. 
the conditioned realm, the body, the the emotional things, the, the the objects of our senses, and so forth, are are relative and and can easily be taken away from us. That's just the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not trying to to even complain about it. It's just the way it is. And so. In meditation, reflect meditation, we keep reminding ourselves, this is the way it is. But the aim isn't to just think the way it is in a kind of passive uh, uh, fatalism. Well, that's the way it is. Life is like that. It's not that. But it's moving to, to realize the deathless is the aim of the Buddha Dhamma. Or in terms of Christianity, union with God, or it, it, these, these are the words or the metaphors or the symbols for that experience of realization, returning to the source, coming out of nothing, returning to nothing. And that nothing then say, is something that opens the mind rather than it, it implies a, a denial or a, or a kind of nihilism. No thing, no thingness. Because I felt when contemplating Master Hua's corpse was that he wasn't really dead. The body was dead. But what one really respected and loved about Master Hua was deathlessness. Wasn't the body. Wasn't uh, his personality. Wasn't his kind of uh, charisma. Wasn't uh, any of these, these conditioned things that were, were temporary and relative to situations. But getting beyond just the, 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 the attachment to those, those qualities or those conditions, was the love of the truth, or the love of the ultimate reality, or the whatever you say, the love of God, or the love of the Dhamma. So there was a, uh, so that love then taken away, as it, as it, say, as we transcend uh, projecting, uh, attaching. Uh, creating attachments to things that we love, people that we love, when we, when we stop that, when we let go of that, then we begin to realize love, or life itself, or deathlessness. So even, even concepts like eternal life, which I used to scoff at, and say, they're Buddhists, we don't believe in eternal life, when you when you contemplate and get beyond just the the ordinary uh, interpretations of those words or the the emotional associations that you have with them, you begin to recognize a reality beyond the words being used. You realize the truth that not not just the not not trying to interpret. From the, from the meaning of the word. The word themselves are there as a kind of reminder, but not to be attached to, not to be held to in the worldly way that we usually think. Like nothingness, emptiness, uh, no, no self, desirelessness. When we think in, in our worldly way, that sounds like annihilationism. It sounds like a bleak nothing, a boring kind of total vacuum. Eternal life, then, uh, is, 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 sounds positive. But eternal life is always based on, on positive images, and on happiness and, and happy relationships and beautiful things. In heaven, are there any mosquitoes or wasps? Hello. 
<laughs> Here at Amravati we have a lot of wasps. I was at the Leicester Summer School, just got back yesterday, a beautiful place in the botanical gardens, sitting there in paradise with wasps. <laughs> We'd eat out on the lawn and then they'd, they'd, they'd go for your watermelon. And they drown themselves in your orange juice. You don't even have to rescue the blasted things. And then just as I was coming back, one stung me right here. Heaven they wouldn't have wasps. <laughs> Unless you are a wasp, like I'm. A wasp is an Americanism for the privileged elite of the of the <laughs> means white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, <laughs> and I'm sure in an American wasp heaven that, that's all that's there. <laughs> well, I'm boring. That would be. I mean, be, be stuck with a bunch of wasps. Mm -hmm. Forever. <laughs> now, this reflecting on on say love, then in, to to say uh, we use things like unconditioned love, or in Christianity, Christian love, or what is it, even though we, we have, you know, and we can see romantic love or, or love can, can uh, of course, mean almost anything now. It's used in, in all pop music. And so it, it's, a, it's the most kind of ordinary word that, that's yet very powerful. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful word, whether, no matter how much it's abused or how vulgar we, we might be with the word, you know, use it for, for just anything. But in it, but in it, but when we, but it is a word that we need to, that we can contemplate. And so when, when I contemplate that word, just the L-O-V-E, English word, and taking it to a, to a, to an experience, uh, say, that I can, say, that from my own experience, not just hearing about somebody else, but from my own experience as a, as a Buddhist monk, say, has love, is there love absent from the life of a Buddhist monk? And so forth. Is this, is this do we lack that love as an experience? And I can, I, I, and how I tend to see this word now is seeing that this, this life itself is love. Because it's a, it's a sacrifice of the self and the uh, selfishness, sacrifice, it's, it's willing to relinquish the world, the conditions, willing to let go, and a, and a sincere uh, endeavor to realize this letting go, this non-attachment, not out of fear of the conditioned realm, but out of love for the truth, out of a real uh, aspiration for for that realization of the truth, and that's something that we all can relate to, all of all humanity. Sometimes you wonder whether Ratko Madlik, Madlik, <laughs> that uh, he gets pretty bad press. But especially if you have a name like Ratko, it doesn't go very well in a country like this. <laughs> but uh, 
Ratko Mladic. It sounds like something from Batman. Um, mm. So the, then life itself, is it just being conscious or is, is life, can we really contemplate life as deathlessness rather than as just consciousness within a, within a separate form? I don't know really, I'm just, just opening the question up. You know, these are words. They're man-made words. So, so they're so the, these words are, are. We can we can contemplate them. How to use them? And if life is just the the if, if death and life are opposed to each other, maybe that's just the way we think and the kind of way we're conditioned to perceive. He's alive. He's dead. And that's it. But in terms of of the religious aspiration and the and the mystical realization of deathlessness then life is takes on a different sense the unconditioned because is the unconditioned dead is the nothingness that master hua comes from and goes back to is that dead is that deadness or is that life. And the condition that was born, grew up, grew old and died, that was consciousness, form and consciousness, that dies because it was born. So is the unconditioned or the ultimate truth, is it dead? Is it deadness? Or is death merely uh, the simple ending of what was born, and and then as we contemplate this in in a, through a mindfulness and wisdom, we begin to realize deathlessness is reality, not not the facts of life where you're born and then you die and that's it. That's the that's the kind of cynical uh, hard line. But in, when you really pay attention and, uh, and, and, and witness to, to your conscious experience, that's not how it seems at all. That's not what I'm picking up through when I'm really mindful. I can easily fall back into the old patterns of thinking and, uh, and go along with, uh, with, the, with the worldly attitudes because I'm used to that. That's how I, that's how I, my mind works on the thinking level. But in terms of the insight and realization, that's not what, that's not what I'm getting. So I want to end the formal part of this talk at this point, leave you contemplating that, and then have a break, 10, 15 minute break, and, uh, we can have some tea, and then uh, for those who want to pursue this subject any further, you're welcome to come back and we will discuss it.